Okay, I think we're ready to get started with the, the next panel. Again, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, our panel three today is going to deal with energy security and transit in the Black Sea region. And I just want to quickly uh, introduce our moderator, Otto Tabuns, who is here from Latvia, uh, Riga. Uh, he's with the Baltic Security Foundation. He's the uh, founding director of the Baltic Security Foundation. He's also an excellent Toastmaster in Georgian, so <laughs> um, that, that's one of the main reasons why I asked him to join us. <laughs> Thank you, Ada. <laughs> Thank you very much, Maya, uh, Didi Matloba, and uh, of course, uh, as we just had lunch, and perhaps Gabby Marjas could also be appropriate, uh, but of course, uh, hopefully that will lift our spirits up because um, I think uh, our panel has a uh, quite uh, challenging uh, task of uh, bringing the energy levels up, and not only in the uh, quite uh, uh, literally uh, sense uh, after the very nice lunch that uh, we had, but also in the uh, figurative sense uh, talking about uh, the very important subject of uh, energy security and transit in the Black Sea uh, region. And uh, for that purpose, um, uh, the FPRI uh, have uh, gathered together a great panel of experts, um, uh, from whom I expect to uh, learn a lot, and I think uh, that sentiment will be shared in the audience. And let me introduce, uh, uh, on my left, uh, Ms. Svetlana Ikonikova, the Associate Professor uh, at um, uh, University Technical University of Munich, uh, specifically, uh, uh, Professor for Resource Economics, which I think is very topical uh, within the uh, realm of our discussion. Uh, then uh, let me introduce you to uh, Damian uh, Kornievich, I hope I pronounced that right, thank you, um, who is the Director um, for Policy Research, Analysis and Publications of Institute for Development and Diplomacy at ADA University in Baku. Uh, and uh, further on, uh, we uh, see on our panel uh, Mr. Bruce uh, Panier, uh, the uh, Central Asia Fellow at Foreign Policy Research Institute. And then um, uh, to the left, uh, we can see uh, our panelist Maximilian Hess, who is also a Central Asia Fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. So I think it will be a fascinating combination of perspectives from uh, Europe, uh, America, uh, and uh, Asia, uh, based on both the experience of our panelists and of uh, what they have researched. And hopefully uh, it will be uh, quite uh, easy for us to achieve the task of uh, keeping your attention at this very nice and beautiful afternoon. Uh, so uh, with that, I think uh, we have to start with an uh, introduction and uh, setting out some of uh, the basics of the situation. And I think it will be very much helped by uh, building on uh, the presentation that was uh, previously presented and using, uh, if we are permitted to do so, uh, of uh, looking at the Great Black Sea region as interconnector. And uh, perhaps if I could ask uh, Mr. Panier uh, to start with a, a brief overview, what are some of the key aspects that we have to remember when thinking of the field of energy and energy security? Uh, thank you very much, and thank you to the Foreign Policy Research Institute for uh, sponsoring this conference and for inviting me, of course, and thank you for Ilya State University for being the venue for this. Um, I'm going to talk about Central Asia, uh, but I promise I'll be headed across the Caspian and points further west by the end of my presentation. Um, and we all know that, that uh, Kazakhstan has huge oil reserves, and if the Astana Times is correct, some three trillion cubic meters of natural gas. Uh, Turkmenistan has the fourth largest reserves of natural gas in the world, uh, some 17 trillion cubic meters at least, and has significant oil reserves also. And this is what Europe wants when it's looking at, at uh, exports from Central Asia. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about energy security in Central Asia because it has significance when we're considering uh, Central Asia as an energy exporter and also as a trade corridor. I mentioned Kazakh oil and Turkmen gas. Uh, but most of Central Asia still relies on coal for, uh, for the, it's the majority of its electricity. Uh, its power plants are still coal-fired. Turkmenistan, of course, is an exception and will be throughout this presentation uh, uh, because it's still, it, with its gas supplies, it actually is gas-fired power plants. 
Um, Kazakhstan, I mentioned coal in Kazakhstan, for example, still uses coal to produce some 70% of its electricity, which is strange. Um, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Uzbekistan have increased their use of coal in the last 10 years. Uh, skies in winter above Bishkek, Dushanbe, Tashkent, and cities across much of northeastern Kazakhstan, as well as Almaty, tell the story about how much coal is being used. Air pollution in all these places is bad and going worse. Uh, Bishkek regularly ranks among the 10 top cities in the world for air pollution during winter months. Uh, Central Asian officials say they are committed to decarbonization of uh, their power generating facilities, but many of the power stations were built during the Soviet days. They're coal fired, they're, some are 50, 60 years old, uh, and they're breaking down when demand goes up during the winter and in the summer too. Um, <coughs> Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have uh, started a national gasification program uh, to wean themselves off coal. We'll see how that, that works. Uzbekistan started that 10 or 12 years ago and, and actually 15 years ago even uh, and built all the gas pipes and never put gas in, in a lot of them. Um, so uh, And for years pointed to Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan as, as having not tapped into even 10% of their hydropower potential because I want to do hydropower. It's really important also. Um, now there are predictions that the glaciers in Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan will all be melted within the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, climate change is already affecting Central Asia, and some models show Central Asia can expect to be one of the worst affected regions from climate change in the world. So hydropower might actually not be an option for generating power for long. Uh, renewable energy, all the Central Asian countries are, uh, with the, again, with the exception of Turkmenistan, Moving forward with renewable energy sources, uh, Saudi company Aqua, uh, UAE's Mazdar, there's several Chinese companies, some others are building solar power stations and wind farms in Central Asia. Uh, Kazakhstan signed a deal last year uh, with European Renewables Group Stevin to build a green hydrogen facility in Western Kazakhstan powered by solar panels and wind turbines. Uh, this isn't scheduled to start operations, however, until 2032. Uh, Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan are also uh, talking about renewable energy sources that include uh, nuclear power. Um, they're both considering nuclear power plants at the moment. We'll see how far they get, and especially in the case of Kazakhstan, you can expect there's going to be fierce popular resistance to having a nuclear power plant. Uh, however, the offic officials in Kazakhstan seem set on, on actually building one. And both Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have set goals of having at least 30% of their energy balance provided by renewable energy in the coming years. So. Uh, the big question is, can it keep up with population growth and the growth of industry in the region? Uh, they're, they're moving slowly toward this. The populations are, are growing phenomenally. I'll, I'll use Uzbekistan as just one example. Uh, the population, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, was for somewhere 22, 24 million maybe. Um, it's 36 million now, 30 years later. Uh, I know Kyrgyzstan just reported that it had 59% population growth between the time the Soviet Union collapsed and now. Uh, so they're having a lot of hard, they're having a real hard time meeting demands as the populations are growing out there. Um, and it's also worth noting uh, that uh, in terms of exports, uh, Uzbekistan is a unique example, but it, Uzbekistan was a natural gas exporter until just a couple of years ago. Uh, but because of its growing population, growing demand, um, it has turned from a gas exporter into being a gas importer at the moment. Uh, and, and just to remember that a little more than a decade ago, Uzbekistan was considered as being a contributor for gas to the Southern Gas Corridor project, uh, to the Nabucco project. In fact, I was at conferences in Budapest and in Prague where Uzbekistan had representatives uh, to, to talk about their contribution to the gas systems out there. Uh, you know, same for CASA 1000, the hydropower project uh, to export electricity from Kyrgyz and, and Tajik hydropower plants to Afghanistan and, and Pakistan. You know, again, with the with annual precipitation decreasing, glaciers melting, um, CASA 1000 was never finished, but it probably, due to the situation in Afghanistan for one reason, but also because of the problems they're expecting to have with water, it might never be finished at all. Um, so, unfortunately, we can't close the book on burning coal in Central Asia just yet. It is the fallback resource whenever the power is, when they're having uh, problems with power. Um, so, really, besides Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, the promise of Central Asian energy exports is diminishing at least. And now I'll move on to connectivity. Um, moving gets from Central Asia, 
uh, or through Central Asia between Europe and, and uh, or between East and West, uh, the Middle Corridor. In fact, it's the hot topic of connectivity at the moment. Um, it's a lot of projects. I, I see people identify what the Middle Corridor is, but I'd like to mention some of the projects that make this up because it really is has been like a, a stew that's been in the making for a long time. Uh, you know, the Trans-Caspian International Transport Route is, is often identified as being the Middle Corridor. Uh, but China would say it's the Belt and Road Initiative. The Asian Development Bank would, could rightly claim that it's part of the Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Program that was started more than 20 years ago. The Lapis Lazuli Transport Corridor uh, that comes out of Afghanistan through Turkmenistan and across the Caspian. Even, I suppose, uh, the Black Sea Caspian Sea uh, Transportation Route, which uh, I haven't really, it was created by Azerbaijan, Georgia, Romania, and Turkmenistan in March 2019, although I haven't heard much about it in a long since then. Uh, and I have to give a, a, you know, a shout out, so to speak, to the Northern Distribution Network, uh, which showed that this could work. I mean, this was actually what NATO used to, uh, when they lost the use of transit through Russia, uh, to supply, bring goods in and out of Afghanistan for troops that were, that were uh, part of the operation there. Um, that, that did prove that, that you can get stuff across the Black Sea and across the Caspian Sea. Um, so the point is, the east-west transportation infrastructure already exists in Central Asia. All it needs is to be expanded. And thanks to Russia's ill-advised, I'll use the word ill-advised, there's much stronger language that could be used here, full-scale war in Ukraine, uh, there's finally a big push from many parties to see the Middle Corridor become a true major trade route. The Northern Corridor through Russia, I know you're not a fan of that, uh, is, is not an attractive route anymore uh, due to EU sanctions on Russia, due to Russia's growing isolation. So what does Central Asia have to offer in the way of east-west trade and transportation? Uh, well, according to China's com uh, commerce ministry, 90% of the railway traffic between China and Europe uh, goes through Kazakhstan at some point. Um, so there's three railways at the moment, and Neva might correct me later, but I think there's actually three railways that are operating at the moment that connect China to Kazakhstan. And once they're in Kazakhstan, of course, they can go to the ports, uh, Kazakhstan's Caspian ports, and I'll get to those in a minute. Um, there's also uh, plans to finally build, after all these years, the china kyrgyzstan uzbekistan Railway. Uh, that will also have links that would take it to Caspian ports, uh, potentially in Kazakhstan at Oktau and Kurik, although also at the Turkmen Caspian port at Turkmenbashi. Um, and I should also mention that uh, there's a multimodal route for goods coming from China um, through Tajikistan that just opened last October. Uh, it's road from China until it gets to Dushanbe, but then it goes by rail toward uh, through Uzbekistan and, and Turkmenistan. Uh, the first shipments went through Iran and went to Turkey, but that same railway can also be diverted uh, in Uzbekistan uh, to go up to Oktau or Kurik, or uh, it, when it gets to Turkmenistan, it can be rerouted and go to the port at Turkmenbashi city on the Caspian. Um, so that's, that's just an example of all the routes that they have going now that, um, that are usable uh, for trade between east and west. Um, and Uzbekistan also has a new, this is where Uzbekistan comes in, Uzbekistan has a new railway system uh, that they opened that goes to Oktau in Kazakhstan. A couple years ago they opened another one that goes to the Turkmenbashi port. Um, so this is another route that connects China and Europe, uh, potentially. Um, and a little bit about the ports. Um, a lot of money's gone into building these modern ports in, in the last decade. Uh, Turkmenbashi city, I mentioned, and Oktau and Kurik. Um, you know, the planned capacity of Turkmenbashi city's port is gonna be 25 million tons annually. This will be important when, I think Damian's gonna talk about a lot. Uh, yeah, okay, so this is, uh, you know, the, the capacity, the targeted capacity is gonna be 25 million tons. Uh, Oktau, is supposed to be 19 million tons, although I've seen different 19 million tons, although I've seen different figures for that. And the same with Karik, my, the figures I'd seen for years were 7 million, but I've seen more optimistic figures given uh, too. Now, interestingly, um, Kazakhstan's prime minister was just in Azerbaijan last week. He said uh, that it used to be that it took these, it took 
53 days to transport cargo from China all the way to Europe. But that with the improvements that have been made recently, it's down, down to 18 to 23 days, and they're shooting to have it to 18 days at the end of this year, and eventually to 10 to 15 days to go all the way from China into Europe. Uh, Okay, I had mentioned the big ticket item, obviously, for Europe is, uh, is Central Asian energy resources. Um, Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan have been shipping, shipping modest volumes of oil through Azerbaijan for years, but a recent deal with Azerbaijan should see Kazakhstan start to ship one, one and a half million tons of oil through Azerbaijan annually, uh, which would be exported to customers in Europe uh, across the Black Sea, uh, possibly through Tur some through Turkey. Um, it's also a good time to mention that Cosmonite Gas owns the oil terminal at Batumi uh, in Georgia. So Kazakhstan's well set to take advantage of oil exports through there. Uh, I, I do need to mention though that um, one and a half million tons, is, it does sound modest. And, and actually if we look at how much oil Kazakhstan is currently exporting through Russian Black Sea port at Novorossiysk, that's more than 50 million tons a year, right? So um, the new line through Oct through Azerbaijan will not compensate or replace the amount of oil that Kazakhstan needs to ship through Russia, uh, which will tie Russia and Kazakhstan together for years to come. Um, and okay, I've got us from Central Asia to the west side of the Caspian. Uh, but from my last remarks, I just want to again emphasize that the middle corridor is now very important, not only for Central Asia, uh, which where they've been developing the infrastructure for years, but it's got this new importance for the European Union and also China. And this is going to help to develop this middle corridor because once it's important for Ch really important for China and really important for the European Union, um, they'll push the countries in between the route or along the route to open, uh, expand and open up new lines, new route, shipping routes, uh, whatever, and as fast, as quickly as they can, which is really what Central Asia needed. You know, for years, as long as the Russian route was open, I understood, you know, I understood that uh, it was familiar, right? They've been using the route for years. They knew everyone that was working along it, uh, you know, so if there was any problems, you knew who to contact. So even though they had all this new infrastructure being built, there wasn't a lot of enthusiasm for, for doing it. But the situation has changed. So this is going to help the, the middle corridor open up, uh, help Central Asia really uh, become much more connected uh, to the rest of the world, certainly to Europe and, and China. Um, and it, it's since it's in the interest of all these countries, uh, and I think at this point, I, I'm sure I haven't even used 15 minutes, but but that's fine. Uh, I only got three or four hours sleep last night, so I'm really coming to the end here. Um, so uh, we're starting to see results, uh, and at this rate, the middle corridor's value should be clear to all soon enough. And with that, I will say thank you, and that's it for me. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Panier. So I think we have now established the Trans-Caspian connection and are crossing the sea. And perhaps Mr. Uh, Prunievich could uh, tell us more how it looks from the perspective of Azerbaijan and its vicinity. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. It's glad I'm glad to be here. Thank you, FPRI, to Ilya State University, and my fellow panelists. Uh, look, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the conflict over Ukraine. We wouldn't be having this conversation in this place on this topic if it weren't for that. But not so much the Russian invasion part, but the decision by the West to impose sanctions and export restrictions on the Russians. That's the reason that the middle corridor has become, has gained in such strategic importance. Uh, and, um, you know, it's just one of the consequences of all of this that has happened. But so, and, and Bruce is completely right that there are a whole bunch of different names and concepts and nascent institutions that are talking about more or less the same thing, Middle Corridor, BRI, Global Gateway, whatever you want. But all in all, whatever you call it, and depending on whether you're emphasizing the Chinese aspect or the Western aspect or whatever, it's basically the only game in town. And all you have to do is look at the map, which is why I've asked to put that up there. Right? The middle corridor is key to furthering the strategic ambitions in Eurasia of all the major powers. The United States, the European Union, and some of its more important member states, Turkey, China, India, you name it. 
The middle corridor is all about connectivity. And there are two really categorical aspects of this. There's the energy aspect, and then there's all the other stuff. Digital infrastructure, security architecture, food supplies, access to critical raw materials, and all of this then needs to be transported. And the only way to do that, going west to east or east to west, is to go through what we're gonna call the middle corridor, just so that we don't repeat all the terms. And it has essentially three elements, or three aspects. There's the road and rail aspect, so the land aspect. There's the, there's the ship aspect, the, the, the sea aspect which involves the Caspian and then later on the Black Sea. And then there's the air aspect, uh, air freight, air cargo, which is, per, in terms of percentage, it's very small, but in terms of the, um, the strategic flexibility that this gives in terms of just on time delivery and all that kind of stuff, air is the way to go. And it just so happens that the second largest uh, uh, freight cargo provider in this part of the world and beyond is based in Baku. So, there's a genuinely serious infrastructure aspect to this that is going to get updated and, and made sort of more and, and sort of mainstreamed in the time ahead. Central to this, um, the, 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 the president or the director of the Alat Free Port, uh, which is really a dry port on the Caspian, south of Baku, his name is Talaz Yadav, he talks about the importance of um, <clears throat> understanding uh, places like Alat as five-star hubs, right? Where you can, um, you can get any service you want, from logistics to, um, to because, of the, uh, because of the free zones, to putting things together, to adding value to goods and services, that kind of thing. And if you think about it, and if you look at the map, you see that Azerbaijan is the indispensable country for addressing all of these strategic ambitions, right? It's the strategic prize, because you can't go north, you can't go south. That's it. Um, you know, particularly in the context of energy security, of, of, of becoming a strategic provider of energy security to uh, Turkey to some extent, but particularly to the European Union and to Europe more generally, including the Western Balkans. Right? There's a prehistory to this. There's the contract of the century uh, from 1994 that used first existing infrastructure up to Novorossiysk and then Supsa, and then the eventual building of a new flagship oil pipeline, the bakut bilisi Jehan pipeline. Um, so there's the oil aspect of it. There's the the natural gas aspect of it. 1999, the discovery of a massive gas, uh, uh, what do you call it, field called Shak Denise. In 2006, the first phase was launched, um, the supply of gas to Georgia and to Turkey, about 11 BCM a year. 2013, the second phase was launched. This ultimately led to the construction in a phased way of the, um, Southern Gas Corridor, that added another 16 BCM into the energy mix. Southern Gas Corridor started operating at the end of 2020, fortuitously, given what happened afterwards. An incredibly complex value chain piece of infrastructure goes through six countries, three and a half thousand kilometers, cost $40 billion to build. And now you've got 10 BCM <clears throat> it's going into the EU via the Southern Gas Corridor, particularly the third part, it's called the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline. It starts at the Turkish-Greek border and ends up in Italy. And there's an un there's a undersea aspect to it. And the strategic importance of this, even though it's only 10 BCM, is rooted in the fact that it's designed to be expandable. And when you put that together with the fact that there's this decision now that's been made to for the, for, for the European gas market to divest itself entirely of Russian, uh, well, not entirely, but almost entirely of Russian gas, then all of this be genuinely gains in strategic importance. So in 2021, Azerbaijan supplied 
uh, of, of the gas that existed in, that was used in Europe. 2022, it turned out, it rose to 6.9%. And there's a deal in place, and I'll say something about this in a moment, say something more about this in a moment, that's supposed to double the capacity of the Southern Gas Corridor, particularly that third part, the Trans-Adriatic Pipeline, that then is likely to see uh, up to 20 and maybe a little more BCM of gas go through that pipeline and supply the European energy market. And basically that means that we're talking about double digits in terms of percentages of gas, of Azerbaijani gas that's going to be supplied uh, to the European gas market. Uh, and because of the way the gas market works, if you take all of the Russian gas or all of the gas that goes through the Russian pipeline system, you find a situation in which, thank you, you find a situation in which um, you're not going to be able to meet the needs without using Azerbaijani gas, even if you go onto the spot market, which is, of course, more expensive and all that business. That's just the way the market works. Now, this isn't even talking about all of the fun stuff that can happen across the Caspian, right? Some of the, the, uh, the trading that goes on that then where you end up maybe kind of sort of perhaps using gas that's not, that doesn't originate in Azerbaijan but putting it into these, in the pipeline system that starts there and goes through Georgia and so on, Turkey and ultimately into Italy. Um, but at the end of the day, if you look at the strategic equation, Today, you see that Azerbaijan is really the, the biggest energy security blanket for the European Union. And you have a long-term strategic energy partnership between the EU and Azerbaijan and then some of the neighbors by almost implication. And it's based on two fundamentally important documents. And it's usually these documents don't mean a lot because it's a lot of just blah, blah. But in this case, it's genuinely important because it lays the foundation for, um, for a long-term strategic partnership that really is a game changer. So there was an MOU in July 2022 that was signed by the President of the European Commission and the President of Azerbaijan. And then there was a follow-up MOU that was signed, or it's really an agreement, that was signed in December of last year between Hungary, Romania, Georgia, and Azerbaijan in the presence of the same president of the European Commission. So the July 2022 MOU has three parts. There's a shared commitment to double the capacity of gas that originates in Azerbaijan and ends up in the European Union. And that means that you have to add a whole bunch of uh, compressors to the existing pipeline network, which is technically feasible to do, doesn't take that much time to do. And the consequence of this was two very important policy reversals by the European Union. First, the EU in this document committed to support, I'm quoting, long-term predictable and stable contracts. And this is a policy reversal because for a number of years the EU had, had explicitly decided that it wasn't going to do that. It wasn't going to sign any new contracts. It was basically going to rely on Russian gas and LNG and all that business and to acquire whatever else was needed through the spot market. But the choice to divest itself of Russian gas meant that it had to reverse that policy. <coughs> and Azerbaijan was there. The second policy reversal had to do with financing. Right? Again, there was this commitment not to buy banks like the EBRD or the European Investment Bank or even some of the commercial banks because of shareholder uh, uh, pressure and so on, there was this understanding that no new hydrocarbon uh, projects would be financed. And that's basically out the window now. So that's the first part of this July 2022 agreement. The second part has to do with the promotion of renewable electricity generation. And then the third part has to do with renewable hydrogen. Now, um, there's something also that's of geopolitical importance here to understand. The agreement that produced this MOU, but the original Southern Gas Corridor project in general, was really based on a serious negotiation. 
um, a real and substantive negotiation. And that's not usually the way the European Union negotiates, and NATO for that matter, negotiates with partners from this part of the world, whether they're in Central Asia, in the South Caucasus, in the Western Balkans. <coughs> usually the way this works is that the, 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 the Brussels party says, here's what you need to do, we're going to evaluate your progress, and when we're satisfied, then you get to move forward. And that's not really a negotiation. It's like a car inspection, you know, where you have a checklist, you show up, before you register your car, the inspector has to make sure that your car is in accordance with whatever laws and regulations are there. And it's, you don't say, well, wait a second, I know my taillight is busted, but on my word, I'll get it fixed in the next six months, but just let it go. It doesn't work that way. Well, I'm from Serbia, so it works that way in Serbia, but in principle, that's not the way it should work. You just have to fulfill the criteria. But all of these agreements were not conducted on the basis of that kind of a negotiation. All right, and then the second one, and, uh, <coughs> the second important one, uh, this agreement or MOU was from December of 2022. So again, Romania, Hungary, Azerbaijan, Georgia. And this fundamentally has to do then with, with the Black Sea region, right? And the agreement was about the supply of green energy. Azerbaijan is going to supply solar and wind power onshore and especially offshore uh, sources. Georgia is going to supply a whole bunch of hydropower. You're going to have an undersea cable that goes under the Black Sea that is being built in such a way, or that looks like it's going to be built in such a way, because the talks are ongoing, that it's going to be able to carry a whole bunch more capacity than the contracts that are almost certainly going to be signed in the first phase between the Hungarians and the Romanians on the one hand, and then the Georgians and the Azerbaijanis on the other. And that is in part because the World Bank and the IMF has done a bunch of serious studies to demonstrate or to estimate that Azerbaijan has something like 157,000 megawatts of offshore capacity. There's some onshore capacity too, which is fine, but it's not that stupendous. This is a game changer, because that comes out to about 20 times more of Azerbaijan's current installed energy capacity, including all of the hydrocarbons. So that's why this is so strategic. Um, because it reinforces the point that Azerbaijan is sort of the keystone state, to use Nick Rosdev's term, the indispensable country for realizing particularly the EU's ambitions in terms of energy and transport and connectivity in this part of the world, and then looking further east towards Central Asia and ultimately the Chinese market. And so try as you might, you can't go around this part of the world, and particularly you can't go around Azerbaijan. And all of this obviously has implications for China, and for Russia, and for Turkey, and for the EU, and ultimately for the United States. Um, you know, maybe I can end on this. Right now, Russian railways is not being sanctioned because everybody understands that the northern corridor still has to kind of sort of function. But that's not going to last forever. If nothing else, you're going to run out of things to sanction, so eventually Russian railways will have to be sanctioned. And, you know, when that happens, the idea is, through a whole bunch of agreements that are now, that have already been signed, projects, some of which Bruce mentioned, that are ongoing, to really optimize the potential of the middle corridor. So that this really does become the only game in town, not just conceptually, but actually on the ground, in practice. And that's something that is going to benefit, obviously, this part of the world and Central Asia, but if done right, is gonna benefit the European Union, but also the Russians, also the Indians, potentially, also the Chinese. It's one of those strange things, if you think about it, this is one of the only geopolitical theaters, so core Eurasia, let's say, in which you can make a reasonable argument that doesn't sound ridiculous, in which all of the major powers don't actually have to look at this part of the world through a zero-sum lens. And a lot of that has to do with what's going on in other geopolitical theaters, some of which are neighboring. Um, 
But if at the end of the day there isn't this kind of understanding, and a championing of the, of the strategic potential of this part of the world by the countries that make it up, first and foremost, then everybody will lose. So you can really, you know, the Chinese have this term win-win. It really is one of the few places on earth, given geopolitical circumstances, in which there is room for win-win. Right? Bruce brought up, and I'm sure Svetlana's going to talk about this too, the Kazakh oil that's coming into Azerbaijan. It, it is 1.5 million that goes through BTC, but there's another 3.5 million apparently that's gonna go through Georgia in different ways and the Georgian ports and so on, and also end up in the, in the European market, right? But all of this again is to bypass the Russian pipeline network. And it's impossible to do without doing all the other related connectivity stuff, if you really wanna make it work, and if you wanna get all the outside stakeholders to have a, um, to buy into it and not to try to ruin this project that could really be of genuinely long-term strategic importance. That's all I got. Thank you very much. And uh, indeed, uh, whereas we uh, cannot uh, overlook uh, Azerbaijan or the Caucasus region, and we have to note that uh, several of the key um, uh, world uh, actors have uh, the mm, stake and interest in the region. Uh, I think uh, we would certainly benefit from uh, another perspective um, because um, Professor uh, Ikonikova, I have to mention, is not only an associate professor in Munich, uh, but also is uh, a senior energy economist at the University of Texas at Austin. So I think we'll have a, a Euro Atlantic <laughs> perspective. And I think in addition to that, uh, we would certainly uh, need uh, some um, hard data uh, and uh, additional information to complement the political and practical aspects that we have covered uh, with the help of our previous speakers. Okay, thank you very much for those introductions. Yes, I like to usually work with data. Um, however, we didn't have the coffee after lunch, so I'll try to entertain you with the pictures. And usually picture worth a hundred words or a thousand words, so in my case it comes with the words. So let's see how I'll manage that. In that regard, uh, let me first start uh, with the fact that coming from both sides of the Atlantic, I bring the perspective that the conversation that we're uh, currently having here about the Black Sea region is increasingly important, not just for the local parties, but um, also for the worldwide. And all the energy-related discussions that we currently see, um, either in Germany, where I'm coming from, uh, where we had really cold winter, or uh, from the US, from Texas especially, where uh, the oil and gas operators keep asking how much more do we need or can put on the, not just local market, not just to the US market, but also to the global market, and what will be happening with prices. And so with that, um, I have my kind of own map for that. Um, uh, I will show the ones that we created, but on that one, what I would like to emphasize, and I know that you've heard that story uh, many times today, but I want to kind of add a few words uh, here as well. So the Black Sea region is on the crossroads, yes, uh, connecting Europe, Asia, also Middle East, that increasingly plays the role, whether we talk about energy security or whether we talk about the energy transition, to which I'll come back. Um, and with that, it sits in between and with that kind of connects and feeds out of different cultural, economic and geopolitical background. With that, uh, we've been talking today a lot about the politics. We did touch on energy. Um, Damien did mention that beyond energy, we now start looking increasingly into the other resources. To support our energy transition, to support sustainability decarbonization, we need to mine more copper, cobalt, lithium, others. And where is it coming from? Uh, and where is it processed? So that's where our eyes increasingly on the Asia, on the global south, whether we talk about the Middle East or the African countries. And so with that, looking into the part that sits right in between um, of all those um, crossroads, uh, we see how Russia has been shaking the ship. And it has been the shaping, uh, shaking that ship economically, politically, culturally. And so across all these um, different uh, possibilities, bringing into question the independence of the region, its ability to develop and make its own plans on kind of where and how to go next. And uh, with that, looking into the security questions, looking also into the projects that will uh, help develop infrastructure that may further support both economic growth as well as the sustainability across all those different goals that you put out there, uh, we need to um, 
embrace it again in the framework of all what's around. And so here come some pictures and entertainment. So let me start a little bit kind of from the past. So uh, we've heard today that the history quite a lot determines how we see this deviation at the moment. Um, I'm showing you the pictures for the BC, so before COVID, uh, so before the shake. And so what you see on the left one, um, so in 2019, US just started becoming the net um, energy exporter. And uh, it also depends on how you really count that. That's why here the piece on the blue. But the way to look is on the map is you look into the blue areas and that shows all the countries that have been energy importing in the net terms. And yes, I'm talking about the, all the energy out there on their energy balances versus the red countries that are energy exporters. So with that you see kind of how you see the split between the countries with more democracy, with more stable regimes, and the countries that has um, less democracy that are also has uh, that are prone uh, to the politically uh, political dictatorships. With that, um, if you look uh, in the Black Sea region, uh, then you'll see that it sits right between the red and blues, and it's kind of that pale color which makes you unclear on whether those countries importing, exporting, and that's because they can actually do both, depends on whether we look into the situation yesterday, today, or tomorrow. Because as Damien mentioned, we look into the change in the world where we try to see how the fossil fuels will change its position on the energy markets, on the, in the energy systems, local as well as the global. And with that, we see change in the geopolitical order and the influence all these countries that are dark red uh, here will have in the future. If you look into the right uh, map, um, so that one shows uh, some theoretical calculations, but um, I believe it's still quite speaking. So there is such a thing in the network economics, it's called betweenness centrality. So it tells you not just how central you are, how important you are, but how important your position as a bridge. And uh, quite often, this is the map that shows you where you may see the emergence of hubs. So that's what you see kind of in the uh, bright yellow color. But if you see everything in the pink, it means that the country is either already taking over increasing flows going kind of through them, or they grow as a, uh, a potential hubs for the different international um, trade uh, 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 product groups. And so that, yes, Turkey stays there kind of in a bright uh, pinkish color, but so do some other countries in the Black Sea region. And that emphasizes that um, what was said also in the previous um, session before, that we have to turn into consideration and look into the, uh, take into consideration also the changes in the international flows. And so with the international trade, we see how more goods going from uh, China, from the uh, Asian region to the European region through that corridor. Uh, we also see uh, the potential, as uh, uh, Damien mentioned, for more uh, flows for both energy and non-energy natural resources there. And uh, by looking into the maps, it's nice kind of we see who is important, who is not, but we also have to pay attention back to the question about the infrastructure, that the flows may not be straightforward and not so easy to capture. And so with that, um, if you look into this uh, dark blue bar um, on the left of the uh, pictures that just appeared, this is, uh, can be characterizing, again, all the energy that comes from Russia. If I look into how that energy primarily, um, that cal those calculations focus on the natural gas, goes to different countries, what you see is not that just it goes from Russia to another country. Quite often, this is re-export. This goes to hubs from where it gets distributed further. And then it comes to the question, back to the discussion of the role of the European Union and back to the uh, arguments regarding the solidarity. If Germany would have to push certain natural gas to Belgium, but now it's short of the natural gas for itself, would it do it? How would it do it? What about Turkey? If Turkey gets enough natural gas that's sufficient for itself, will it re-export it further? So what's going on? How do we set up that infrastructure? How those contracts and those markets are set up? Um, and that's not the end of the story. So if you think that you know the markets and infrastructure connecting those markets is complex, think further. The countries are related with regard to not just individual fuel trades, but they also further take those fuels as inputs to their industrial production. And um, I had hard time to find uh, the data uh, for the metals um, and copper production in Georgia. So they, uh, you do have them on the Georgian side, but not on the international flow embeddedness. So I made that um, diagram for Turkey. So what it demonstrates, it demonstrates that 
if Turkey runs short of, uh, of natural gas, for example, or any energy, which is their uh, key underlying input for the uh, uh, processing of metals, then starting with that small uh, pinkish um, square that shows you the mining and quarrying goods, you can see how it goes to all the other industries related, how it goes to the um, chemical, to uh, production of the machinery, um, light uh, manufacturing, and so on and so forth. And that's not just for the Turkey. It starts there, spreads through the industries across the Turkish economy, but then goes to many others. And I'll get back to that in a second. And with that, when we think about those flows, about those relationships between the industries and across the countries, now I get back to Georgia, and here I have to show that uh, looking into Georgia deeper, as I was preparing for the visit here, um, I was interested with the following trend. So if you look into the bottom um, uh, wiggly worms plus, you'll see the Georgia's uh, export and Georgia's uh, GDP from mining. So what does it tell you? It tells you that Georgia has a lot of potential increases GDP by looking more into what and how it processes and produces copper. So think about where Europe wants to take all that copper to fuel its energy transition. So Georgia could be one of those uh, playing an increasing role there. And the same would apply to China that increasingly becomes a big uh, partner for Georgia as we also heard in the previous session. Um, Russia is also there and so it comes to the question on who and where will cut the flows, and not just what kind of impact will it have on one particular country, but back to that map with the hubs, back to the diagram that shows the flows across the industry, what further echo it may have uh, around the world. Okay. And so here, coming back to the um, echo around the world and how do we approach the conversation about the security. So we're prone to measure security, we're prone to say it's enough, it's not enough, but actually what we look into is we'll look first into the um, overall portfolio across which we can diversify. Speaking about energy, for example, we can talk about do I put kind of more renewables, what those renewables comprise, not just in my own production, but in my overall consumption portfolio. Because speaking again back to Georgia, Georgia may have great potential in hydro and already produce a lot of hydro, but how much of the own energy production is able to satisfy Georgia needs? It still relies more than 60% uh, on the export, uh, on the import of energy. And uh, with that, looking kind of now into the plot that shows the data for the concentration of the natural gas import trades for uh, the major economies. Um, on the x-axis, uh, you see the volumes. On the y-axis, you see the concentration. The closer it is to one, kind of the less different uh, 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 suppliers you have there. So what you see is if I put the line out there, and uh, that line has been uh, also uh, backed up by the modeling that we do uh, looking into the development of the natural gas markets around the world, is what we see is that the smaller the volumes you buy, the smaller uh, the volumes you need, the harder it is for you to diversify. So it's easy to come and say, please diversify uh, your uh, imports. But how can you do it if infrastructure is costly and it's really hard to negotiate with 10 different countries that you need a few molecules from them because you want to diversify? So the data tell us that that's not how the economy functions, even if we really want it. But what we can really do and change about that is we may try to see how cooperation among some nations may help us to improve as we increase the volumes as we look into the region overall. And here it comes to that word um, that I don't know uh, how many of you know, uh, but being on the PhD, it was the eye opening to me uh, as I did my PhD on the game theory, is you not necessarily have to talk about cooperation or competition. You can actually talk about both. You can try to see how you can cooperate when you think about the infrastructure project. And then you can look back and see, but how do I do that project and still stay independent and look into what does it mean for my economy? How can I share those profits? How can I share both the costs and the benefits and do it in a fair way? And here, um, back to the history. So um, I know what happens with Ukraine is horrible, but um, as I mentioned, so I did my PhD on the um, supply of the Russian and former Soviet Union Republic's gas to Europe. And at that time, we were studying all those negotiations between the Russia and Ukraine, trying to see how to improve security there. And at that time, the Germany supported the Nord Stream project, which we said 
would not be commercial a success, no, it will be commercial failure. However, if you look into the possibility to set a bypass across the major transit country, you can change the distribution of bargaining power, you can change the economics um, of that whole supply, and that's what uh, Russia and Germany did. And so the question is, was it a good decision? Huh? Not really. However, at that time, you definitely can see additional benefits for that. And that would uh, change the position and the economics of Ukraine uh, and the relationship between the Ukraine and Russia. And without uh, looking into their um, left map, so you can see how their pipeline system has been forming and how it's been changed, and with that they changed the bargaining power in the region with it Nord Stream C, and why it was so important to Russians at the time, and even now it was the first uh, reaction uh, by many other na nations once the Russian invasion um, started. But then looking onto the um, right map, so that one shows again in the brighter colors, uh, the importance or the centrality uh, for the countries. Um, and here, besides the China, that kind of serves again as a hub, uh, tunneling the energy flows to many Asian countries. You see um, the bright colors in the Ukraine while surrounding um, countries are dark. So now my question back to the infrastructure questions, if you change uh, the color scheme, if you start changing the colors here because Ukraine at the moment uh, is not uh, able or not willing and potentially may decide kind of not to facilitate the transport of the energy and other resources uh, to Europe at all. So who will take its role? And so that's where uh, we get to the question, um, where do we establish new infrastructure? Where and how we establish those interconnected? We have a lot of projects on the table. How do we manage them? We see a lot of opposition from um, individual countries who are afraid that that will change their position how to resolve those uh, conflicts, how to build the resiliency considering joint benefits. So here, um, I'm not gonna show formulas, but I do want to show that um, simple animation. So if you look into the network, this is how it looks like, okay? What happens if I take out the center node? If I say I cannot uh, anymore allow Russia, or maybe kind of Ukraine will decide not to connect uh, the two grids. So now you have two islands, and now you have to deal with a very different um, conflicts with a very different uh, market structure, different supply uh, and resiliency issues. And that led us to their uh, perception on how the risk and economic loss can be distributed. And here, uh, what you see on the plot, you see how the uh, close you could be to the 45% line, which means that, yeah, you take one node, um, you lose kind of one uh, unit of economic value. So the green line shows is things happen randomly. Yeah, kind of, yeah, I may lose something, but things happen. If you look into the um, red dots, so we did an experiment. What if I on purpose would want to hurt particular country or particular grid? So then you can take out just a few members um, of that corridor or a few parts of that infrastructure and you can do a lot of harm. And so with that way I'm leading to is uh, looking back into the propagation of shocks. You have to pay attention that if I take out that uh, mining sector in Turkey because I interrupted energy supply to Turkey from Russia, kind of now they're big friends, but who knows, then you'll see that it will echo through the industrial relationship disruption around uh, almost the entire world. Yeah. And so with that, um, uh, begging up uh, um, Damien and uh, bringing the end uh, to my conversation is we have a lot of plans. How do we have to look at it? We'll have to look at it not as challenge, we have to look at it as an opportunities. And as we look into all those different ways how you can build those uh, pipelines for natural gas, for, uh, for oil, invest in renewables, invest in their uh, transmission lines, whether we are considering building another super grid, not just in Europe, but also in the Black Sea region, um, here's what we uh, need to pay attention to. We have to think about this type of geo uh, not just political, but geostrategical planning. So we look into the map and we think how bring planning and strategy together. And that's where we have to pay attention to what's going on with our energy or other resource mixes. Um, how do we look into the local supplies? We are not just thinking about what the Black Sea region can do for Europe uh, or what Europe can do for the Black Sea region. We think about mutual benefits and we have to uh, review the needs. With that, uh, move to the review of all the options we have at hand, and then try to optimize the system considering the bargaining power, considering its resiliency. 
And uh, with that, um, we have to uh, pay attention that it's not necessarily just cooperation or competition. We can put the two together in a competition and with that move to the more resilient, not just local, but the global system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. And now I think it would be very uh, helpful uh, for us um, with the help of uh, Mr. Hess to see uh, what are we still missing in this discussion and looking at some political risks or uh, some other aspects of the conflict and uh, other implications of energy security and this region uh, in context of this question. Uh, what could you add, please? Thank you. Could you put the map up again? Yeah, just, so, uh, uh, well, um, thank you all to my co-panelists. Um, it's been really uh, fascinating uh, learning from all of you um, already. And I'm going to conclude our, at least, uh, discussion presentation of the panel um, with uh, a focus on gas, because uh, natural gas is the uh, market not only of the past that's been key to so many of the developments that we've heard about, and some of which I'll go in uh, to discuss a little bit more from my own viewpoint, uh, but also I believe is going to be um, the focus of the future. And I think that uh, events like this are so important because uh, in my opinion, the Black Sea region is the most unstable part of the world. Um, and I don't say that with hyperbole, I say that very simply. Look at the history of this region going back to 1991. There have been at least 10 conflicts uh, on the Black Sea, literal immediately, and that's excluding Syria. The First and Second Chechen Wars, uh, the Georgian Abkhaz conflict, the Georgian Civil War, the Russian invasion of Georgia, 2008, the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2014, the Russian invasion of full-scale invasion in 2022, the conflict in Transnistria and Moldova, uh, and then of course um, the first Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and then the second Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. And that's also not including the uh, ongoing issues in southern Turkey uh, as well. Um, so I think it's really important that we you know, focus on uh, cooperation um, and ways to mitigate potential future conflicts, um, both uh, kinetic ones like that as well as in uh, the key markets that are very closely related to them. Uh, and I believe that uh, in this region, natural gas uh, is the one that is most closely related to the conflict. You can see that from the um, Putin shutting off of Nord Stream pipelines, the explosion on them. Uh, Svetlana's uh, points, I think, are very well made about the importance of Ukraine and Russia's anger at that, um, uh, or at least displeasure at it um, in its role in supplying gas um, to Europe. And then, um, of course, uh, this area, as uh, Damian was speaking about and Bruce was speaking about, in terms of future gas supply uh, to Europe are going to be critically important as well. Um, so uh, I'll talk in sort of two parts. First, I'll, I'll do a little bit of, of the history again um, and, and some issues that I think are really important uh, uh, going up until the full-scale invasion and then talk about um, what has happened and what is important uh, for the markets uh, since then. Um, so, uh, for the last 15 years, the European Union has had its Southern Gas Corridor uh, program. And uh, you have to remember, this was a very different time, especially for our students uh, who, who are here. Um, uh, this is a very different time in uh, U.S.-European cooperation with many issues, uh, particularly over the legacy of uh, the invasion uh, of Iraq and the disasters that followed from there. Um, but uh, around 2007, uh, there was one thing that you could hear uh, in both Brussels uh, and in Washington, D.C., where there was a broad agreement on, um, which was the Southern Gas Corridor. Uh, Dick Cheney literally once said, I have a dream uh, of building Nabucco um, all the way to uh, Turkmenistan. Um, Nabucco was the original proposal for it that would have been a large um, gas pipeline carrying over 60 billion cubic meters uh, a year, as Cheney proposed. Um, from Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, and potentially even Iran uh, to um, the European Union, uh, creating an alternative to Russia's gas supplies. You have to remember in 2005 and 2006, Russia had already begun uh, to weaponize gas and shut off its supplies uh, to Ukraine. I was uh, living in Switzerland at the time, um, although I was myself a very young student, and you know we felt the impact there of Russia's gas uh, turnoff. So um, it was very much Russia already um, pushing towards this agenda. But uh, despite getting some new support after the um, Russian-Georgian uh, War in 2008, uh, Nabokov really uh, fell off of the agenda. Um, 
the uh, in part because uh, there were fears about building such crucial energy infrastructure so close to an area where uh, Russia had already attacked. Um, and uh, it was only after 2014 that um, the Southern Gas Corridor and the importance of building alternative supplies uh, to Europe really began to get as much attention again um, and to really be driven. And there, um, we have to say, it really wasn't the European Union which uh, was the key factor in getting it pushed forward. It was, it was the governments of, of Georgia, Turkey, and uh, most particularly Azerbaijan, uh, which took on uh, the lion's share of the financing for uh, the pipelines that eventually were built and opened in 2020, as Damian mentioned, uh, the um, Trans-Anatolian pipeline running uh, across from um, Azerbaijan through Georgia uh, in the Southern uh, Caucasus pipeline, uh, through the Trans-Anatolian, across Turkey, and then into the Trans-Adriatic pipeline across Greece, Albania, uh, and on to Italy. Uh, now, Russia was, of course, uh, undertaking its own action to try to counter this uh, at the time. The initial plan uh, launched before 2014 um, was um, to build a pipeline across the Black Sea into Bulgaria. Uh, ultimately, that was blocked through a combination of uh, U.S. sanctions threats and uh, warnings from Brussels that it was willing to cut off funding uh, to Bulgaria's government, um, which at the time had a very strong pro-Russian bent and was willing to go through with it. Later that year, however, um, in the sort of beginning of uh, the partnership that we now see today, uh, Vladimir Putin was actually the one who unilaterally announced that he was halting uh, efforts to try to build the pipeline in a visit to Turkey that September, uh, where he announced the um, uh, where he announced the Turk Stream pipeline as an alternative to South Stream instead building a second pipeline from Russia over the Black Sea into Turkey. There, there's a pre-existing pipeline already called Blue Stream um, that predates uh, sort of the issues that we're talking about here there as well, uh, as well as the Akuyu nuclear power plant, which I'll talk about very briefly uh, again at the end. Um, which would be Ross Adams' largest foreign power plant project and which has made some uh, notable progress uh, over the last year despite the full-scale invasion of Ukraine and the onset of sanctions against Russia. Um, uh, so, you know, ultimately we ended up in a situation where uh, finally this pipeline was built, but really it was a result of regional cooperation uh, and far less the support that it got um, from the West. There were some crucial financing guarantees that were very important, uh, but as I said, the lion's share of financing came uh, from the region itself. That didn't lead to um, immediate stability, however, uh, and uh, in some ways there, it, it helped attenuate its own risks. Azerbaijan's position as a key uh, European energy supplier uh, helped lead to the conflict in 2020 uh, over Nagorno-Karabakh, um, where we saw the Second Karabakh War, where frankly Europe has no ability uh, and no willingness to uh, hold uh, the Azeri forces to account for the atrocities that were committed there. Um, and we risk ending up in a situation where we switch from uh, one gas-rich uh, kleptocratic dictatorship to another uh, and have to be very careful uh, about the risks that involve. I'm very happy to say that there's been a lot of progress on negotiations mediated by the EU uh, and the US uh, over the last six months, and hopefully we do finally get to a, a peace settlement there. Um, but not all of these benefits are necessarily all straightforward. Uh, and some of them uh, carry their own risks. Uh, but today, as um, we highlighted, we sit in a situation where Russian gas uh, is largely cut off. Uh, what gas still continues to flow is through Turkey, um, as well as uh, the remaining, as Svetlana was talking about, through Ukraine. Those uh, transit deals come up uh, at the end of 2022. And the gas price shocks that Europe experienced last year played a very large role in leading to uh, the inflation problems that we see across the continent and still today. And the globalization of gas markets over the last decade uh, through LNG has led to the first time over the last two years where we see real direct correlation between global gas prices, uh, something that has uh, had real major effects very far abroad uh, from the region that we're talking about now. Uh, perhaps the country most affected uh, by all these energy crises and the gas crises uh, is, is not in the European Union or in the Black Sea region or, uh, at all, but is Pakistan, uh, which saw all of its gas contracts unilaterally canceled over the last year, leading to a major energy crisis because gas traders and gas suppliers could sell their gas to the European Union uh, at a far higher price, um, and that has led to a rolling political crisis there uh, for the last year and a half, 
um, that uh, also has some notable implications for Russia because, of course, the, uh, pre the prime minister who was ousted um, during all that, uh, Imran Khan, uh, famously met with Vladimir Putin on the day of the full-scale invasion and defended that. Now we have elections coming up uh, in Pakistan again by October uh, where these issues will play again. And Imran Khan, if he's allowed to run uh, by the military, um, is very much uh, in the lead. So uh, today we find ourselves um, in a situation of needing to diversify away from Russian gas uh, while avoiding some of the risks that this instability and that these um, various competing powers in the region have uh, so as to avoid more conflict um, outside Ukraine and so as to help keep uh, gas prices down. One thing I would say is there's been a lot of talk lately in the European Union in particular that we've sort of uh, defeated the, the gas risk. Germany has opened uh, two uh, new LNG terminals already, has plans to open three more. Spain has opened one. Algeria has begun supplying uh, 10 billion cubic meters more of gas to uh, the European Union uh, than it, it did previously. Um, and it actually has the capacity for more because of their own political disputes, refuses to send more gas to Spain through Morocco. Um, and uh, the uh, Situation will get quite critical, however, uh, if we have a very cold winter once again. And there's precedent for history in this, uh, which is we had a relatively mild winter in much of Europe last year, uh, but people forget that in the aftermath of World War II in 1946 was one of the coldest winters uh, that uh, Western and Southern Europe ever experienced, and that that led to um, major blizzards uh, across the UK, for example, where I live, and played a real role in the uh, ongoing economic difficulties after, even though it was primarily a coal-powered um, sector at the time, gas power didn't exist in the same way. And I think the European Union faces a real risk. Uh, you know, I'm certainly no meteorologist, um, but uh, if we have a very cold winter again this year, despite those new supplies that we have, uh, there's uh, uh, some very real challenges that we face. Um, so now the question is, is you know, how stable and how secure is the Southern Gas Corridor going forward? Uh, you know, the risk of Russian troops who lie within five kilometers of some of that pipeline, of some of those pipelines that I mentioned earlier, is very real uh, and is very active. Um, in Armenia and Azerbaijan, as I said, we're having peace talks now, but shooting still does occur quite regularly. Uh, the good news from at least the energy security perspective is that the Azeri military has far larger capabilities than the Armenian military. Um, and so it is unlikely that if there was a return to full-scale conflict or conflict along the lines that we saw in the 2020 Karabakh war, that the Armenian military would be able to directly uh, target Azeri gas infrastructure. Uh, but if the Armenian nation um, was threatened, uh, that is a very real risk that I think we need to look at. Now, um, Azerbaijan will play a crucial role uh, in supplying uh, gas going forward, as we discussed, um, but there are real issues to consider there. Uh, and um, one factor that I would mention is Azerbaijan, for example, is importing uh, a billion, uh, just over a billion cubic meters of Russian gas this year because the Shah Denis II field hasn't proven to be uh, as lucrative or, or as productive as was initially hoped. Uh, Azerbaijan is also increasing its swaps with Turkmenistan, uh, in which gas is swapped um, through uh, Iran that uh, look like they're on track this year to hit just 1.2 billion cubic meters. Um, but one of the other developments that we had between 2014 and 2022 was the signing of the, I believe the translation is legal convention on the status of the Caspian Sea, in which Russia has a formal veto of new projects um, under that sea, uh, although it still hasn't been ratified by the uh, Iranian parliament, so there are questions about whether um, it's in effect, but through that, uh, the big reason that Russia signed that and the reason that they were willing to lay uh, down the other parts of the dispute uh, over the Caspian status that had been ongoing th for 30 years was to try to block um, any hopes of gas infrastructure being built uh, across the Caspian. Um, obviously, Russia doesn't really uh, adhere to international <laughs> regulations in any way, um, and that's sort of where I want to end, uh, which is, you know, the 
call for more cooperation on these matters so as to avoid the risks of more conflict on the immediate Black Sea coast to ensure that the region can be a stable energy supplier uh, for Europe going forward um, and avoid its own conflicts and then really to consider um, how it can be possible to uh, achieve that dream that once the EU and Washington shared of having a southern gas corridor uh, that runs not only all the way to Azerbaijan but further afield as well. We've seen some pretty key uh, geopolitical developments in the last six, seven months with um, Saudi Arabia and Iran agreeing to restore their ties, discussions of a new um, deal, or at least the rough parameters of a new deal between the United States uh, and Iran. Uh, of course, one of the other developments that um, you know happened in the last 10 years was the unilateral U.S. abrogation of that deal uh, under the Trump administration. Um, and then finally, how to um, find a sustainable way uh, to potentially get Turkmen gas um, across the Caspian see um, whether that's through pipeline or through expanding um, some of that infrastructure uh, in Iran. So um, I thank you all for listening and uh, I hope I wasn't too negative, but uh, I hope that there are ways that uh, on this sort of bevy of risks we can find ways uh, to continue cooperating um, and uh, have that ensure stability and prosperity uh, for the immediate region and um, both sides of the Caspian and Black Seas going forward. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Hess, for uh, a realistic addition of the uh, political nuances of the situation. Um, uh, I think uh, now concluding the discussion part of uh, this panel, uh, I think this has been the most interesting and valuable uh, addition to our knowledge about the subject. Uh, but uh, I'm sure I would be disinvited for dinner if I would not come back and ask for more mm -hmm. from our uh, very knowledgeable participants and start with some of the questions that I would like them to answer uh, before opening the floor up uh, to uh, your questions uh, in the audience. Um, I have uh, three questions in mind and then I would give the floor to each of you uh, and uh, you may decide on uh, which points you would like to uh, respond. Uh, looking at some of the major points that uh, I observed throughout your um, uh, comments and uh, speeches, uh, the first uh, would be a national security question uh, because uh, with issues such as a population increase, uh, food and energy deficit and climate change, uh, would uh, these factors would be um, inhibiting any potential uh, cooperation. Uh, for example, um, especially with taking Russia into account, and as we heard um, uh, today, uh, for example, uh, Georgia's dependence on grain import, uh, the um, uh, uh, population increase in um, Uzbekistan, and the question of uh, needing to import rather than export gas, and how climate change is affecting Europe. So there are several national security issues uh, in the region, and that would be the first question, how that would affect uh, cooperation with regard to energy security. Uh, the second question I would have is uh, with regard to uh, shared and differing interests of Russia and China. Uh, do you think we can talk about um, uh, competition uh, in this case, um, or uh, perhaps uh, we will not see them uh, aligning so well that uh, it would actually hurt us here on uh, this side of the world with regard to potential of energy security. Um, my final question would be about the hardware or uh, if we would follow up uh, the claim that infrastructure for energy exists but uh, needs to be expanded. Uh, if you would be the leaders of the free world or uh, someone would enough of resources, what would be the number one priority in expanding infrastructure that would uh, immediately uh, improve the situation uh, and that should be done as the first step. So uh, just repeating the first question about the national security factors, uh, the second about the external uh, players such as Russia and China, and the third about the infrastructure uh, that uh, would need to be expanded in your view. Uh, Perhaps Professor Ikonikov, you may start. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I, I start with a kind of quick answer the way kind of I see them. I think that um, back to your question about the national secre security, I'll say um, check the alignment of interest and think about NATO. So if I learned anything today, it's about um, how NATO really thinks and why we have all these nations there and kind of how do they make their decisions. So I believe that uh, speaking about the energy or any other security, we have to think in a very similar fashion. 
So you cannot do it alone. You have to do it kind of in a conglomerate, and you have to figure out um, based on what principles you would uh, invite uh, the other nations and the other participants into the coalition. And uh, with that, um, I'll kind of uh, jump to the last question and then um, have a quick one to the, to, the, um, to the second one. And so the same with the infrastructure. So if you think about the infrastructure, there is kind of not the top one priority, at least from my perspective, but it's kind of rather the question on um, who is deciding, who is kind of bringing the money at the table, who looks into the cost and benefit sharing. And I think those have to be kind of looked all together. And of course, I'm speaking as an economist, but I believe that a single kind of only political will uh, or only military interest cannot make it. You have to kind of add the money to the equation. And with that, uh, coming to the second one about Russia and China. So as one who studied how the development uh, of the relation between the Russia and China changed after 2014, when the Europe already started cutting uh, trading relationship with Russia and Russia turned to China, um, I should uh, uh, say, look into the China's policy, look into all its voluntary restrictions on how it deals with uh, US and other countries. China does not want to make the uh, mistake that uh, Germany did. It doesn't want to grow uh, this interdependency and high dependency on their partner, big or small out there. And so um, in that regard, um, I don't uh, think there will be a much further kind of exponential growth in the uh, trade balance uh, or any other support from China. China will remain distant and very balanced with regard to what's going on on the global arena, from my perspective. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kurnievich, please. Thank you. Uh, I, I guess, in, look, all of these, all energy projects tend to come with a certain degree of risk. The question is, how can you manage that risk? Right? Um, or how, what can you do to at least minimize it? And so, you know, Max mentioned this, and it's important to, to bring up, right, the possibility of, of, of parts of the pipeline infrastructure getting, getting attacked by, by the Armenians. Um, on the other hand, I think the retaliation would be particularly um, uh, memorable. And it seems unlikely that, that the consequences of that, if you think them through, the geopolitical consequences in the context of you know, the ongoing peace talks and all the rest of it, um, it seems unlikely that that kind of step would happen unless you have rogue elements in the Armenian military or the Armenian police or the Armenian services that might choose to, to do something without authorization, which is not impossible because there have been rumors that have been going around for a long time that Pashinyan, the Prime Minister of Armenia, doesn't control at least all of the elements of this, which is very, very worrisome, not just in the context of, of the provision and the diversification of energy security uh, for Georgia, but also for Turkey and for the European Union, but in general with regards to the possibilities of, of Armenia degenerating into something that could lead to being understood as a failing state, which is bad for everybody in this region, because as Max has pointed out, uh, it really is one of the most volatile places on earth, depending on how you define the geography. Um, but I do want to talk about one other aspect that I think is genuinely important, and that has to do with these hopes and, and, and sort of, I would say, frankly, fantasies that, that, um, that there's going to be any serious um, likelihood of large quantities of gas from Turkmenistan coming in. This is, people have been talking about this for 30 years. Uh, there's a possibility that you can build an interconnector to carry one, maybe two BCM per year from the Turkmen side in the offshore part of the, of the, of the, of the gas field that, that, that is shared with Azerbaijan and then somehow kick that into the existing pipeline structure and all that. But First, that's not going to fundamentally change anything. The needle will hardly have moved. Uh, and second, um, you know, it, that raises the much more serious question about what is preventing, um, what correlation of forces, what geopolitical circumstances are preventing Turkmenistan from really um, taking that step to provide, you know, astronomical quantities of natural gas. And uh, the very short answer is fear. 
fear of the reaction of a particularly uh, volatile neighbor. Uh, and that's, you know, to come back to this whole to this whole business about how it's a volatile region. That's why it's never going to happen. Because in order for that to happen, not only would serious security guarantees have to be provided by, you know, not just Azerbaijan, not just Turkey, not just the European Union, but the United States. Um, Long term, as Nick Gwazdev talked about, treaty-based security guarantees for that very serious, clear and present fear to be overcome. And that's never going to happen. So the best that you can do is to tolerate swaps that are taking place amongst some of the countries in the Caspian Basin and accept the fact that as a result of these swaps, um, some of that, some of the, I mean, if you just, you have to look at the geography of the way the, the pipeline structure works. But basically what it means is that it, it almost certainly guarantees that gas that originates in actual Azerbaijan is going to be the gas that gets fed into the pipeline network and ultimately ends up on the European market. Um, that also means that some of it that ends up in the non-European market will not have origins that would be understood as being entirely in accordance with the laws of Kashrut, but fine, <laughs> uh, because that's something that in principle should not affect decision-making and risk assessments in the context of the European Union. And I think that's very important to understand. In other words, part of understanding the risk assessment is is figuring out how to diversify and cut up the risk. So there you go. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Panier, what would be your views? Thanks, thanks. Um, Okay, uh, start with inhibit cooperation. And again, I'm dealing with mostly Central Asia. Um, and this one, you know, there's a couple things going on here. I'm, I'm going to use the example of line D, the proposed line D of the Central Asia China gas pipeline. Um, it's supposed to be the biggest one, carry 30 billion cubic meters of gas uh, from Turkmen, solely Turkmen gas. Uh, but it's going, it's proposed to go on a new route. It's going to go through Uzbekistan, but then it's going to go through Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, neither of which will receive any gas. Uh, all the gas is going to go to China. They will get transit fees, which is good, and they would certainly help both those countries. Um, of course, both those countries have been involved in serious clashes last year and the year before. Uh, several hundred people dead now, uh, lots of property destruction. Um, you know, how, how much cooperation are you going to get between these two? And if one side could, could, kind of mess things up for the other side by sabotaging their efforts at building this pipeline or keeping it maintained, would they do so? Uh, I, my best guess would be yes, they would. Um, you know, especially since, again, they're getting transit fees, which are significant. But on the other hand, uh, they, they seem to be getting, uh, growing farther apart and the animosity is, is growing between them. Um, another thing that, that's going to inhibit cooperation and can really throw uh, a monkey wrench into the whole energy cooperation thing is is water in Central Asia. Um, you know, they're having a lot of water problems and a lot of disputes are already starting. Now, the, the biggest one, the most obvious one, is the one they're having with Afghanistan at the moment over the construction of this canal that's going to drain water from the Amu Darya and leave areas of Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan, downstream areas, completely dry. It's going gonna, it's gonna to lead to the resettlement of tens of thousands of people, certainly probably hundreds of thousands. Um, but uh, there's water issues between uh, that Kyrgyzstan has with its neighbors too, with Uzbekistan and, and Kazakhstan, uh, where Kyrgyzstan is also suffering drought but doesn't need to if they were willing to divert water for domestic purposes. That obviously doesn't play well in, in Astana and Tashkent, uh, which are far bigger countries also. Um, but, but this is going to be an issue that will inhibit cooperation because if, if the upstream countries feel that they're their own agriculture and their, their own domestic needs are, are not being served because they're having to release water downstream uh, to their neighbors who have not been kind to them in the course of the last 30 years. Let's be you know, frank about this. Um, you know, that, that's also going to inhibit cooperation. Uh, Russia, China, energy, uh, you know, is, um, security. As far as it, Central Asia is concerned, I don't really see 
um, that much of a problem. Clearly, Russia views Central Asia as a competitor for the Chinese energy market. Uh, that has been an issue for a long time. Uh, I mentioned line D of the Turkmen of the Central Asia China pipelines. I mean, the, the three existing pipelines, um, you know, are eating at the share of what they would, you know, Siva Sibiri, what, what Russia would prefer to sell themselves uh, to China. Um, so, so that is something, um, you know, and I know that this, I know very well from traveling all around Central Asia that the Central Asians are real keen on Chinese cooperation. They, they have a real fear of, of their own government signing away too many things to the Chinese. Um, on the other hand, China has been a constant, stable economic partner through a lot of, you know, the, the global economic crisis in 2008, uh, the global economic crisis hit when the oil prices dropped in 2014-15, the global pandemic. Uh, China was always there the whole time. Russia's up and down. I mean, they're, they're hit harder by these things, and so their ability to um, maintain influence and help out the Central Asians goes up and down along with that. Uh, it, it, so, I, I, you know, again, China, Central Asia is a, is a com competitor for Russia as far as the Chinese energy market. The Central Asians know is the, Russia is the devil the Central Asians know. They would prefer to deal with them. Uh, they absorb a lot of labor of migrants uh, who would otherwise be unemployed in Central Asia, just for one example. Um, you know, uh, uh, but again, China has shown that it's, it's a constant. Uh, and and, and when times are bad for a lot of countries, China has been the only thing that's, that's really kept a lot of these, uh, some of these Central Asian countries afloat. Um, the last thing, hardware energy. I agree totally with the skepticism about Trans-Caspian Pipeline. I know that, that Turkmenistan, I'll, I'll name the country, Turkmenistan is afraid of Russia. Um, they, they've said a, bit less, a little bit Iran, but less so. Um, this really kind of, this is one of those, uh, you, can't, you can't know until it's all over in Ukraine. But if Russia really does take it on the chin uh, and, and is, is seriously weakened, um, would there be enough uh, efforts by the part of other countries to kind of push this through? I mean, even when I was in Azerbaijan uh, you know, a couple months ago, that was, that was the sense that they got, you know, at, even from people we spoke with at, at Sokar and in the foreign ministry, um, that, that, you know, if, if the Turkmen thought they'd get away with it and Russia couldn't do anything to them, they would, they would sign off on the pipeline in a minute. That, that's not the reality. But if in a worst-case scenario for Russia in, in, in the Ukraine conflict, if they really lose badly uh, and, uh, and they, they are for, and it causes domestic problems in Russia that the Kremlin is forced to devote all its attention to. Uh, could you sneak a project like that in? Uh, you know, maybe, uh, possibly. Um, so, uh, but, but in the meantime, in, in the absence of that possibility at the moment, uh, I would say anything they could do to build up the tanker fleets in uh, the Caspian would probably be the best move that uh, any outside party could do at the moment. Uh, well, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll try to take the national security uh, question uh, with both the China and the infrastructure questions because I think it plays uh, a key role there. Um, but also I want to respond on, on, um, just very briefly on, on the uh, discussions around uh, the interconnector to Turkmenistan. Um, you know, uh, I, I agree that I think it's very unlikely and that it will never be built. I think Western policy and uh, regional policy, uh, however, towards Iran is completely misguided um, and that the possibility should uh, hopefully one day exist to build that infrastructure not under the Caspian Sea, uh, but through Iran, which, as I said, is already swapping that gas uh, if very small amounts into Azerbaijan, um, despite some tensions between those two countries. Uh, the uh, um, on uh, infrastructure, though, um, you know, the uh, lesson that uh, I think Germany is painfully starting to learn and is what they refer to in the Zeitenwende, the sort of historic epochal change uh, of the attitude to Russia, uh, even though I'm still very skeptical that uh, Berlin has gone far enough, um, is that interdependence, um, the idea that connections between two economies will help and lower the risk of conflict, does not work um, when the country on one end of it is a dictatorship. Uh, it only works when the countries are democracies. So uh, I know it's really um, out of favor, uh, but the piece of infrastructure that I would like to see the most that I think that works around all of this are ballot boxes. Um, democracy promotion uh, should be in something that the West puts at the forefront of its approach to countries in the region and on both sides of the Caspian, as I just 
just mentioned, uh, together with uh, these projects, um, unpopular as that may be today, uh, I don't give up hope that we won't be able to put it back um, in the agenda um, at some point as well. And uh, the U.S. in particular needs to learn to use um, uh, carrots as well as sticks. Uh, you know, and I think Georgia plays a key role in that too. You know, um, despite the the you know recent issues and backsliding, Georgia is a, a much more democratic state than the regional average, and um, can be a, a leader in those uh, examples. And then finally, on China, um, we'll hear later from uh, Neva and others who you know I would defer, certainly defer to on China and its position and all this. Um, but uh, speaking about gas infrastructure, you know, the Chinese dragged their feet after 2014 on um, the Power of Siberia 1 gas pipeline to get a, a good deal, which um, sort of we believe and infer from customs data. Uh, they actually get even less than the Central Asian countries get for, for their natural gas, um, which is already comparatively cheap to market prices or what China pays um, Australia or even Myanmar, uh, Burma. The um, uh, Chinese are now dragging their feet on that again. You know, it's been 16 months or so since the full-scale invasion, uh, and we've had no deal on power of Siberia too. Uh, Putin and uh, Xi like to talk about friendship without limits, but they're two people who we don't believe on most other things, and I really see it as a partnership of problems. Uh, you know, China, um, Russia wants three things from China, clear military support, new financing to replace the lack of access to Western markets, and then uh, that power of Siberia pipeline, Beijing isn't giving them any of them. So as much as Xi wants to show up in Moscow and hold hands with Putin, that's much better to me than him actually giving him uh, those things. And so for that, uh, you know, I, I worry sometimes that the West's policy risks pushing uh, Beijing even further into Moscow's corner. Um, and, uh, you know, that may be something where there's at least less immediate impact on, on um, energy, but... Uh, is certainly something that could happen as a result in part of the growing global uh, LNG market where China now has to um, compete with um, more and more countries for uh, those imports. Um, so, you know, uh, it, it's not a defense of China to say that, um, you know, I think looking, you know, I think China is, is the perpetual competitor of tomorrow uh, for the West, um, but China constructively seeks to build its alternatives Russia's uh, way of doing things is to destroy, um, which I believe is more of an, an immediate short-term uh, um, risk and, and one that if we lose, then you know there will be no competition with China to worry about in the future because we'll already have lost. Um, uh, so yeah, I think the national security aspect on that um, potentially calls for a slightly different approach. Uh, thank you. And uh, we have been kindly allotted 10 more minutes by the host uh, so that we would not limit the freedom of speech in this room. If we could please collect uh, two to three questions that uh, we could then use to uh, close up uh, our uh, discussion that apparently meets more uh, than we thought initially. Short. Exactly. That's right. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Um, Fred Gabar from the Royal Military College once again. So. Uh, so people are not really believing in the possibility of having Turkmenistan being able to actually have a pipeline directly to Azerbaijan because of fear and because of the new status of the Caspian Sea. But if that fear were to be removed, that is, if Russia, in this case, were not able to, to exact that, that menace, then presumably then that gas would flow. Should it not there be, therefore be the policy of the Euro-Atlantic powers to make sure that this gas would flow from Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan so that you could hit two birds in one stone? You would actually compel Russia perhaps to reform, although I don't believe it can be reformable personally. I don't think you can push democracy on that country. It will never work. Forget it. And at the same time, you would actually make China a little bit more uh, compliant at the same time, because you would deny them certain uh, re resources. Should that not be the Western policy? <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll start it out. I'm not going to, you know, West, commenting on Western policy is not my, my big strong suit here, without a doubt. Um, 
you know, you know and, and this is really hypothetically speaking, but, well, first I'll start out with, I met with, years ago I was at an event and I, and I met with some European Union officials, and they were really pushing this idea of the Trans-Caspian Pipeline, right? The, the convention, it was just a few years ago, the convention had already been signed, they said the legal basis for Azerbaijan and Turkmenistan to agree on building a pipeline is already there, there's, you know, and we'll send our specialists in and, um, and, and they'll sign off on, you know, the fact that it won't, it doesn't represent any kind of threats to the environment. Um, you know, it, it, my response was that, it, and when Russia sends its environmental specialists down there and says that they don't agree with that, and the fact that the Russian Navy is really the only Navy on the Caspian, um, what happens next, you know? Uh, now, if Russia, if, again, hypothetically, Russia loses the war in Ukraine, they're losing money on gas sales to Europe. If you pitch it as a deal, right? We'll let you sell gas to Europe again, we don't want you to be down on your knees all the time, but uh, you know uh, you have to let this other pipeline go. And you know, Damian made a good point uh, right after I was finished speaking. So if they can't build it really soon, then there's no point in building it at all. The window's closing on this uh, very, very quickly. Um, so I would, I would just leave it at that. I mean, you know, a lot, of, a lot depends on the outcome in, in Ukraine. Yeah. Can I just? It, it, there's a there's a technical aspect to this that's fundamentally important, right? It takes so if you were to build a big enough pipeline that it would actually make a difference, you'd have to you would you'd have to bit from Turkmenistan to Azerbaijan, you'd have to then build a parallel pipeline, at least along part of the southern gas corridor. It's not enough to double the capacity with more compressors. You'd have to build a new one. And that costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of time. And then you get to the fact that it's, it would be too late. Uh, and that would then affect, you know, what's your customer base, how are you bringing it to market, all this stuff. It's just not... We're looking at it as a market strategy. No, I, I understand if you think about it in a strategic sense, fine, but still it, it would be too late because you'd still, somebody would still have to buy it. If I can word, add two words to that. So one is your competition will be really tough. Mm -hmm. So it's Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, kind of look, the gas from Russia to Turkey. So that's economic one. And the second one is think about Iran and what Iran will do and how China will react, not necessarily just with Turkmenistan relation, but what would it do China to Iran? Thank you. And perhaps one final yeah. question. Um, thank you, uh, Georgi, uh, invited lecturer at Lee State University. Thank you for panelists for very interesting discussion. Um, I, I think that uh, the middle corridor is getting more interest uh, importance after the war and sanctions you mentioned, and it should be optimized, but I don't think that it should be uh, um, the you stay uh, just after the post-war uh, uh, to maintain the same uh, Import, uh, amount of import, scale import from Russia as it was before the war. Uh, because uh, Middle Corridor is not only a regional project, a regional corridor connecting Caspian region to Black Sea, but it's a global uh, um, a corridor which supports enhancing security, uh, peacemaking, peacekeeping in the region, also energy security, and many different kind of ex positive externalities it has. So I don't think that uh, no, those windows are closing fast and so there is no space for uh, uh, large-scale project development in the region. So I think that uh, United States, Europe should focus it as a global project and uh, see as much external, positive externality as it's possible because even those submarine uh, cable project through Black Sea from Georgia, uh, five years ago it was just uh, <laughs> cost inefficient and uh, less imaginable whether it will be implemented or not. But now it's realistic, yeah? Because of its political scale and its security uh, scale and so on. That's why, uh, if there are any additional key barriers which deters uh, those middle corridor development, not only the Transcaspian, because uh, this is not only a scale of uh, Transcaspian gas pipeline or something like that. Uh, there are huge possibility of renewables development in the region, uh, Central Asia and so on. So uh, yeah, this is my question. What, what are the key uh, addition barriers as a large scale project of the I'm not sure I really get the question. I mean, to really get into your question would take an hour. The very short answer is yes, of course, you're completely right. But that's, I think, a very distinct set of 
of presumptions that, that inform that kind of thinking, which is strategic and absolutely on top, and the kind of and the question that that the gentleman to your left was asking. There, there, you know, the the strategic potential of of bringing everybody in in the context of renewables and transport and lots of the other connectivity stuff is really there. The undersea um, green, uh, what is it called, green electricity cable um, that stems from the from the December 2022 MOU between these four countries, that's not going to make money for a very long time. But that's not the point. So you can sometimes make that argument because it makes sense because over time, you know, it's not, but with the gas and Turkmenistan, it's a completely different set of circumstances. That's, that's why I think it's, yeah. And Professor, you said that yeah, last I'll, comment from you. Yeah, please. I'll, I'll just add to that. So I think it depends on what kind of infrastructure and what kind of future you're looking at. Too. Because we're now changing our energy system, we're changing the consumptions, and so it's one thing to talk about transmission and the renewables and other things, and it's different to talk about the fossils. And so I think what we refer to is how the world would look like and the corridor for what would be needed. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it, it really shows that there are perhaps more questions than answers at this point, but I'm very glad that we were able with this very bright panel to, to show the way on uh, that avenue. And with that, uh, let uh, us uh, give a round of applause to the panel. And uh, shortly, um, uh, Vice Rector uh, Professor Galea will continue with the next panel. Meanwhile, you can also find out uh, more about our panelists in the printed materials. And do not forget about the hashtag Changing Tides when promoting our uh, wonderful conference on Twitter. Thank you.